Hi everyone, it's Quickie Baby, and welcome back to World of Tanks. And in today's video, I'm going to be giving you a full preview of the jewel in the crown of the Czechoslovakian heavy tanks. This is the VZ-55. It has a 130mm main armament and can deliver two shells in its autoloader within two seconds of the first shot. Making the VZ-55 the burst daddy of all heavy tanks in the game. So before we jump into the gameplay today, let me get you up to speed on the VZ-55. Well, firstly, this vehicle does not have an autoloader by default. You're going to have to grind 62,500 experience on this tank to be able to get the autoloader. But this isn't a case of stock gun being bad. In fact, the single shotgun on this tank gives this vehicle two ways of being able to play. You can choose the cyclical gun, which comes by default on this tank, which makes this vehicle very similar to a WZ-111 5A. Or alternatively, you can use the autoloader, where you lose some accuracy, you lose some damage per minute, and your aim time is worse, but you can deliver two shots in two seconds with 490 alpha damage. With the introduction of the VZ-55, it will be the fifth tier 10 autoloading heavy tank in the game. Feels like a lot of them. And when you have so many autoloading heavies, it's hard to make them all have their differences. I'm going to compare the VZ-55 to the other four autoloading heavies in the game so you can really see where this tank is going to shine and where you're probably best to get one of the other ones otherwise. So immediately your eyes should be drawn to the gun caliber. This thing has a 130 millimeter, making it the biggest gun of all of the autoloading heavy tanks. However, it's only three millimeters bigger than the Rhinocerante, and so that means that this tank has the same alpha damage of 490. This is 50 more than the Kranvang and 90 more than the T57 Heavy and the AMX 50B. But the real highlight of this alpha damage is that it has a two second intraclip reload, a lot like the T57 Heavy, meaning that you can burst the rounds out faster in this tank than the Rhinocerante. In fact, you can burst the rounds out in half the time that the Rhinocerante will be able to achieve. And while you undoubtedly have a small magazine with only two rounds, that can be really useful when you only want to fire a single shot and then reload, unlike the T57 or the AMX 50B. Now, unfortunately for the vehicle, its damage per minute, it's good, but it's not incredible with the autoloader. Look, it makes the Rhinocerante look awful. This thing, unlike the Rhinocerante, will actually be able to kill the vehicles in front of it fairly quickly. While the Italian heavy tank relies on a long period of downtime to be able to get those three rounds back in the tank and then hope that the vehicle in front of it isn't full health when it comes around the corner. The damage per minute of the VZ-55 is just a touch lower than the AMX 50B, but significantly lower than the Kranvang and the T57 Heavy. So much so that the Kranvang actually reloads an entire magazine faster then the VZ-55 will be able to get two rounds loaded back into the tank. And considering that the Kranvang reloads three 440 alpha damage shells, giving it 1,320 magazine potential, that's way, way, way better than the 980 damage that you'll have from the two 130mm caliber shells in the VZ-55. However, it's the burst damage of the VZ-55 which in theory makes up for this. Unlike the Kranvang, which takes five and a half seconds to be able to deliver that 1,320 damage, the VZ-55 will take two seconds to deliver 980. Making the VZ-55 the new best burst damage heavy tank in the game, as long as you don't need more than about a thousand damage. Free-to-play players will be happy when they look at the penetration of the VZ-55 as well as its 260 on its standard rounds, better than all of the other vehicles apart from the Rhinocerante. However, the pay-to-win players will wince at the 306 millimeters of APCR penetration that this tank has, as vehicles like the T-57 Heavy have 340 high explosive anti-tank, or even the AMX 50B gets 325 APCR pen. So all of this doesn't really mean anything if the vehicle doesn't have the gun handling to be able to use it. And the VZ is kind of up and down within this regard. It has pretty poor aim time of 2.7 seconds, way worse than the Rhinocerante, the Kranvang, and the AMX 50B, just a touch better than the T57 Heavy. Its accuracy is the worst out of all of these tanks as well, so don't expect to be sniping at good distances like you could do in the Rhinocerante. Although, let's be honest, accuracy in World of Tanks? Sometimes it doesn't seem to really feel like it matters when you look at tanks like the Object 430U still being able to snipe fairly well at decent distances with the worst accuracy of any Tier 10 medium. Now, what is awesome about the VZ-55, and while it 
makes the tank feel like it doesn't have that 2.7 seconds aim time is the gun handling. The best dispersion when moving and the best dispersion when turning the turret. And so this means that you can actually fire quicker because your reticle never fully blooms out as much as the other tanks and you don't really need so much aim time to be able to draw it in. This is absolutely wonderful and it allows the VZ-55 to feel dynamic enough to be able to deliver those two taps and then be able to get back to reloading, hopefully, to deliver it again, right? The gun depression on this tank is the worst in this comparison, along with the T-57 Heavy at 8 degrees. This doesn't make the tank feel nearly as flexible as the Rhinoceronti or the Amex 50B, and wow, it pales in comparison compared to the Kranfang, right? Still, 8 degrees isn't awful, and you can definitely make this work on a heavy tank. And it should be noted that this vehicle still has 8 degrees of gun depression with the single shotgun as well as the autoloader. Now onto the mobility of the vehicle. 50 forwards is very impressive. 15 backwards is also very good. Not as good as the Kranvang and the AMX 50B, but definitely better than the Rhinoceronte and the T57 Heavy. And the power to weight ratio of this vehicle, while it's the lowest in this comparison, it's still not bad at 15.45, and it will give this vehicle eh, enough power to be able to get around. But don't expect to be bombing it around like an AMX 50B, and you're going to be slightly slower than the Kranvang, Although its ground resistances are the best in class along with the Rhinoceronte here, which kind of means that this vehicle has not the worst traverse speed. In fact, it's going to be a little bit better than the Rhinoceronte there. One thing that does suck about this tank, however, is the turret traverse. It's only 25 degrees, a lot like the Rhinoceronte, and you won't be able to quickly re-engage enemy tanks like the T-57 Heavy or the AMX 50B can. All right, so now onto the durability of the VZ-55. It has 115 millimeters of frontal hull armor. Doesn't sound great. 90 at the side, however, is the highest in this comparison. And look at this turret in theory. 300 at the front, 150 at the side. It is sounding awesome. So let's actually get into the nitty gritty and take a look at to see whether this frontal hull armor is actually as good as it might suggest. And yeah, wow, that upper hull, when you're not angling and you're away from your opponents, it is very good indeed. In fact, it's almost an auto ricochet until they're up fairly close and then they can aim down on your upper hull. This thing is awesome with regards to that upper hull armor. However, that lower plate, oh my lord, that's one of the worst lower plates I have seen at tier 10. This is not so much a weak point and more of a significant vulnerability of this vehicle and all tanks that it will meet will be able to reliably go through the lower plate even if it's angled like this. Look at that. That lower plate is still vulnerable to 230 millimeters of penetration. So expect when you're coming around the corner, you're either going to get tanged in the side or alternative, you're going to get hit in the lower plate. It is horrible. So with regards to side scraping with this much of a horrible lower plate, even if you were to come around a corner like this and try and keep your side armor decent, you would still be exposing your lower plate. If you were to turn the turret even more to be able to try and avoid the lower plate getting hit there then you start to make the side armor vulnerable to very decent penetration rounds and more importantly because of the shape of the hull if you over angle like this then the side of the vehicle actually becomes a little bit of a weakness as well, especially against high explosive anti-tank rounds, as we can see here. So while the upper hull of this vehicle seems to be very good against armor piercing rounds, let's compare it to a WZ 111-5A firing high explosive anti-tank. Yeah, now it doesn't look nearly so good. And one thing that high explosive anti-tank really reveals is how much of a weak point this thing has on top. I was easily able to penetrate this thing consistently on the test server with the vehicle's standard armor piercing rounds as it feels like the weakness on top of the tank is very wide and even towards the edges it doesn't really feel as if it's that thick. But I guess that doesn't really matter if you're kind of hiding that around a corner a bit like on a T110 E5 for example. With regards to the turret armor this thing is decent indeed. Everything off the top is going to bounce apart from against an FV215B 183 with regards to overmatching. The turret armor to the left and to the right of the gun looks very good with regards to the mantlet and has practically no weaknesses around there and also the vehicle has 70 millimeters of spaced armor to the left and to the right of the gun meaning that even if you over angle the turret and you've got an opponent on towards your left as well unless they use their brain and shoot the weak point above it then they're going to have to get through about 270 millimeters of effective armor there. That is absolutely wonderful. And I can only imagine how good this tank is going to be when it manages to use that 8 degrees of gun depression and only exposes the hull, which now makes the weakness on top a bit of a hard task to hit. 
Be careful, however, because I've noticed that the underflaps of this tank are only 30 millimeters of armor, which means that people will be able to shoot up through the tracks into that armor underneath the vehicle. But all in all, considering this thing has an autoloader, this is looking like a very solid tank. I'd say the Halama is better than the Rinoceronte, all in all, and the turret armor definitely better than the Rinoceronte. I'd say the hull armor is better than the Cranvong. Turret armor isn't as good as the Cranvong, however. It's got all round better armor, in my opinion, than the T-57 Heavy. And arguably, apart from the hull, in certain places of the AMX 50B, it is better armored there. And so that means that the VZ-55, considering how well armored it is, it's all the more impressive that this tank doesn't have the worst DPM, it's got the best alpha, it's got the best soft statistics with regards to the gun handling, not the best aim time or accuracy, but enough gun depression, a good amount of speed, unlike the T-57 Heavy to get around. This thing is looking like a bit of a bruiser. It also has a decent amount of hit points at 2,100, but one thing that really sucks about this tank, a lot like the Rinoceronte and the Cranvang, is it only has 390 meters view range. Meaning that even if you have an incredibly good crew, like I have put on this vehicle, and you're using something like Bond Vents and even a Bond Directive and a Premium Consumable, you're only getting up to 461 meters view range. You could, of course, fix that by using coated optics on this tank, but considering the accuracy of the vehicle, I think that this one is best suited to trying to get up into the faces of its opponents and to deliver those one-two punches as often as possible. Accordingly, personally, I'm gonna take vents, vertical stabilizers, and a turbo on this tank, although I'm sure there will be some people who wanna drop one of these modules to either use the improved hardening or maybe some coated optics to get some decent view range at distance. I don't really feel the vehicle needs to use a rotation device, however, as it has fairly good traverse speed already. So I'm sure a lot of you are going to be preparing crews for this tank, and one thing you're going to be very happy with is the fact that the crew is identical to the TVP T50-51, which means that if you already have a crew for your Czechoslovakian medium tank, and you maybe want to put them inside the heavy tank, they are going to work without having to retrain anything. However, I'm sure a lot of you out there are going to be very sad at the prospect of maybe you purchased the Skoda T45 for Bonds and you've been using it to train up your crew. You're going to have to retrain the commander as the commander is also going to be the radio operator for your new tier 10 tank. So while I personally believe that the VZ-55 is going to be special because of the autoloader on this tank, for all of you out there who want to play this tank with a single shot capacity, let me quickly compare it to the WZ-111-5A so you can see how very similar these tanks are. Same DPMs, they have exactly the same rate of fire. The penetration on the VZ-55 will be better on its standard rounds, but way worse with its gold rounds. It has better rain time, it has better accuracy, it has better dispersion when they're moving, and the excellent dispersion that the WZ-111-5A has when it's turning the turret. It has one extra degree of gun depression, but be careful with the elevation, as that is poor. It goes the same speed forward, the same speed backwards, has very similar power to weight ratio, but a touch worse with regards to the turret traverse and the tank traverse. Its armor is fairly comparable to the WZ-111-5A, but it does have 100 less hit points, and it also has 10 meters less view range. But really, the main issue with the VZ-55, if you want to play it with the single shotgun, is that of course, because it has an autoloader, there's no way to be able to take a gun rammer on this tank. And so consequently, my VZ-55, when it's completely maxed out, can only achieve 3,061 damage per minute, while my WZ-111-5A, with a comparable loadout, can achieve 3,538. And while the argument could be made that the VZ-55 could use another piece of competitive equipment in there, let's be honest, Nothing really compares to maximizing the DPM on a vehicle that already has a decent rate of fire to begin with. Consequently, I feel that considering the huge disparity between the gold rounds between the WZ-111-5A and the VZ-55, the slight advantages that this tank gets in some areas does not outweigh the disadvantages it gets with regards to gold penetration, view range, and importantly, the raw DPM that can be achieved with the tank. But you know what? I think that's quite enough theory crafting. Let's go blow up some tanks.
All right, so firstly, we're going to be spawning in on the revamped version of Minsk. And there's so much opportunity for this tank on this map. Part of me would want to be able to try and plow my way down the east, to be able to attack through the, the new location that's opened up. The other part of me wants to try and bully down the western flank. And I feel like a vehicle like this is going to do incredibly well against a wide variety of tanks, but especially against medium vehicles. Just look at how fast this thing is. I am using a turbo on it, but I'm using a turbo on most of my autoloaders now, including a Krenvang on both of my accounts in ranked, and I managed to have a, a decent result by setting the vehicle up in that way. I feel like this tank, its traverse speed is probably going to be good enough to still use vertical stabilizers just to give this thing the incredible gun handling, even on the move, as we could nearly see there that we were able to connect a shot with the EBR-105. The kind of snapshots I've been able to achieve with this tank have been above and beyond what you would consider for most heavy vehicles. Look, lots of people think that the WZ-111 5A has really good gun handling, but considering that this vehicle, at least with a single shot, is even better than that, yeah, you can see what you're able to achieve. And just, this is what scares me about this tank. What was that EBR-105 going to do, really? Uh, a lot of you out there might be thinking, oh, it's an EBR-105, it doesn't have a soul, it doesn't have feelings. Yeah, but imagine if you'd been in something like a Sheridan, which doesn't have the ability to race across and to get out the way. The kind of burst damage that this tank pulls off is just absolutely outrageous. And considering how good the reload is on this tank, I don't mind firing one and then reloading to be able to, to go again about 18 seconds afterwards when you have this thing fully maxed out with good crew skills and also with good equipment. Of course, it'd be really nice if you could use a gun rammer on it as well, but yeah, apart from the old Italian auto-reloading medium tanks, no auto-reloaders have been able to use auto-loaders at least a high tier, or have been able to use gun rammers, I should say, at high tier. Look how punishing this thing is. Just like that, we do a thousand damage, and that VZ-55 can stop pestering my buddy down inside the dip. I'm really worried about this tank with regards to the uh, just the raw damage output that it can demonstrate in a very short period of time. To be able to put in one, to be able to put in two into another tank, you are just printing thousand lots of damage. Now you could be saying, you could be arguing, well you're, if you're in a... Um, if you're in a 60 TP, you could do 750 with a single shot with the same amount of gun depression this tank has. Sure, sure you can, but 750 is not 980. And also the 60 TP can't even get close to the kind of mobility that this vehicle has. That's more of a, a super heavy tank with regards to its mobility, whereas this thing is definitely more of a medium tank within that regard. And just like that, within the first three minutes of this game, we're already up to 4,000 damage. Although, I have to admit, it's starting to not look very good for us, as we are about to get outnumbered by a huge amount of vehicles. The E50M puts a heat round into me. I don't want to use my repair kit there, because I was worried that the projector would be able to get a shot. And even though this vehicle has 8 degrees of gun depression, it's proving to be quite awkward to be able to work the ridgeline against the E50M. So I'm constantly trying to think, should I reload? Should I not try and reload right now? And this is where this vehicle is awkward compared to something like a Kranvar. Unfortunately for us, we miss a shot on the STB-1. That was a little bit of a rushed one. I shouldn't have done that. And we're going to have a hard time to be able to just take out all of the opponent's hit points. And I have no idea how this single STB-1 has managed to kill a VZ-55 and an IS-4 here and only taken a single shot in reply. Luckily, with our high caliber gun, we can overmatch the side of the STB-1 there. We can put one round in, then we can fire another round into the other track after they repair. And just like that, we're up to 5,600 damage now in the first four minutes of this game. Unfortunately, yeah, I'm between a little bit of a rock and a hard place. And even though this vehicle does have nice damage per minute, it's not going to be quite enough to stop the VZ-55 from being able to deal with us from above. What you got to see here is just how good this thing is in a frenetic game. You know the kind of games in World of Tanks recently where they're over in three minutes? Well, I can imagine this vehicle is going to be fast into position. This vehicle is going to have the upper hull and the turret armor to be able to push against its opponents or at least to hold the position. And importantly, this vehicle is going to have that one-two punch. Thousand damage firepower in two seconds to really be able to to punish its opponents And I can imagine it's going to be very good in the increasingly fast meta of world of tanks 
It was really hard to try and make work on the test server, though, because everybody was playing it. And who would have thought that if everybody is playing autoloaders, that, yeah, is anybody really an autoloader? All right, so I've shown you what the VZ-55 is capable of in a disgusting brawl in a dip. There was a lot of that on the test server when everybody, as I said, is playing an autoloader. They all just want to rush in, see what the vehicle can do with regards to driving around and be able to test out that double tap. Let's slow it down a little bit on Glacier and hopefully I can give you an idea of how the vehicle's gun handling, how the vehicle's mobility manages to hold up. Alrighty then, so we're going to make our way through to the mid ridge. I'm going to try and get some crossfire on all the vehicles and I can't imagine a better tank than this. We're going one and going two. And you notice just how we're fully accurate, fully aimed immediately after firing. This is crazy. It feels like a TVP, but it also feels like a TVP that has fully maxed out its ability to be able to stop the reticle from blooming out. Usually on autoloaders that have incredible intra-clip reloads, I have to use vertical stabilizers and a rotation device to have full accuracy while still delivering clean shots in. However, on this tank, because the gun handling is just so darn good, I don't really need to use a rotation device in addition to the vertical stabilizers. And I think that, at least for now, considering that Bond vertical stabilizers in the, are in the game, I would rather use Bond vertical stabilizers than a bounty rotation device on this vehicle because of its decent traverse speed. I am a... I'm going to say it again. I'm really concerned with this vehicle about how insanely dominant it might be at getting forwards. There's one thing when it's a medium tank that races forwards and is to deliver such brutal damage per minute and burst damage on a ridge line. But there's another thing when it's also a medium tank that can all go hull down and has a really good hull armor against its opponents as well. This kind of feels as if it's Wargaming just building upon their idea of a main battle tank constantly in World of Tanks. Why does everything have to go at 50? Why does everything have to have at least 8 degrees of gun depression? Why does everything have to have good DPM? Why does everything have to have 490 alpha damage like this vehicle does? I guess from Wargaming's perspective, there has to be some power creep to be able to make new tanks interesting inside the game. But it's just, at what expense does this occur? Does it make all of the other vehicles less competitive in the game? Sure it does. Does it mean that something like a Kranvang is now absolutely useless? No, not at all. What about a T-57 Heavy? Maybe more for the T-57 Heavy. Not useless, but this definitely takes away from the shine that a vehicle like that has. Does this thing compete with an AMX-50B? Not really. The AMX-50B was more one of those kind of tanks that wanted to just rush into a position than to deliver a big, chunky load of magazines against its opponents. This vehicle, it's more of like a double tap. It's something that has to jump on an opportunity, and there's no better kind of pseudo-autoloader for being able to achieve that. Think about the Borask, for example. The reason why the Borask is so powerful is because it has high alpha damage and it delivers that high alpha damage in two seconds. It's kind of what this tank is when you think about it. 490 is very high for an autoloader. There's only one uh, autoloader in the game which has higher alpha damage than that, and that's the AMX Fosh 155. But that vehicle has so many issues with it that it kind of makes up for the the 750 alpha plus also consider that that has 750 alpha damage but it also has a five second intra clip reload taking 10 seconds to be able to deliver those 355 millimeter rounds whereas this vehicle you know it's d delivering 490 within two seconds of each other that is absolutely incredible but it's really all of the other aspects of this tank that also make it feel very powerful indeed now, I should mention, as we're trying to chase down this EBR and make sure that we secure the flank and stop our opponents from being able to get around us here, that this is the first iteration of the test server and everything is subject to change. I would argue, however, that my feedback doesn't really matter in the grand scheme of things because with the Renault Toronto, I, I genuinely thought that Wargaming were going to buff it in the second or third iteration of the test, and they didn't. And right now nobody really is bothering to play the Renault Charante unless you're a bit of a hipster 
I'd say the vehicle is less than competitive when we compare it to something like a Kranvang, for example. When this vehicle goes into the game, I think you'd have to be almost a masochist, really, to want to play the Renault Toronte when you could play the VZ55 instead. Um, I guess the Renault Toronte still has an auto reloader and it's got good accuracy and it's got APCR rounds, which are nice, and it does have better premium rounds than this vehicle would have. But just to have the complete disadvantage of, for example, not having intuition, I can manage to switch between the rounds on this tank with intuition in just over three seconds, I believe. And that is an exciting prospect for when you're dealing with very lightly armored tanks, that you can reload an entire magazine, unlike the Renault Toronte, which can only reload a single shell because it's an auto reloader, and maybe load high explosive rounds, and then you've got 68 millimeters of pen and 640 alpha damage. I am very much going to enjoy going in against tier 10 self-propelled guns, or alternatively, maybe sneaking up against... Gosh, think about it, this thing could fight a Borsig, right? It could fight a Borsig. That was a really unfortunate moment there, by the way, because I decided to reload immediately after I fired, but luckily, and then I didn't have the round for the TVP that I was aiming at. But luckily for me, I didn't get penetrated by the gold round from the T-123. Uh, I'll take that trade. I'll take that trade. Not having a shot on a TVP to be able to ricochet a gold round from the T-123, that's looking good. And you're just starting to see the statistics of this tank start to, to mount, right? I wanted to show a slower game so you can get an idea of not just how good this thing is for YOLOing into a dip. And talk about getting lucky. Looks like I got lucky again. And my armor protected me from a T-1023. Or more realistically, I'd say the T-1023 probably just missed my tank altogether and only hit my tracks. But hopefully this slower game will give you an idea of the mobility of the vehicle. It's definitely not the fastest thing you've ever seen in your life going up a slope, but it's by no means slow. And that's again because of the fairly okay ground resistances that this vehicle has on hard and medium. It is pretty bad on soft though. 2.3 or 2.5, whichever way you want to look at it, whether you're looking at the real value or kind of the fake value that Wargaming tries to throw out there. There's a bit of contention in the community right now whether the statistics that you actually see are what the vehicle actually has, or that Wargaming might be providing more hidden statistics. Look, that's, that's a whole different video in itself. All you really need to know is that this thing is no slouch and we're able to get round to where we need to. All right, so now we're in a, a very tricky two versus two situation here, but I'm playing with a, a VZ-55 who clearly is a decent player here. They've managed to give the slip to the T-1023. They're trying to get down the slope. I'm trying to ping the map to let the VZ-55 on my team know that if they fall back, that I'm hopefully going to be able to get shots into them. But quite rightly, they don't want to get shot by the EBR. Um, and they're trying to get some shots up into the T-1023 as they come around the corner. And there we go, T-123 coming. I'm going to wait, I'm going to wait. I want to make sure both of these shots count. want to make sure both of these shots count. There's one, and there's the... Oh, no, he stopped on reverse. Oh, absolute disaster. I feel like an absolute plonker. And even though my buddy there, I'm not sure if this was their anonymizer name, but Max is, is, is best by the looks of it, or Beast, one of the two. I let them down. They're playing like an absolute hero, literally giving me the easiest opportunity of my life to be able to put a couple of rounds into the T-1023. Great job there. Great job. And now we've managed to change the situation from a two versus two into a two versus one. And I'm not going to waste any time here at all with trying to put some pressure on the EBR-105. The worst thing that I could do right now would be able to give the EBR enough space to be able to take out my friend. And then how am I ever going to be able to find an EBR by myself? What I need to do right now is be aggressive, try and find out where the EBR is. If they shoot me, it's not even really the biggest deal. In fact, I would probably take a shot from the EBR right now. I mean, I'd rather take a bounce, but I'd probably take a shot just to be able to know where the EBR is because the only real threat is not knowing where the EBR is, not delivering that information to my friend and to then allow the possibility of the EBR flanking and taking out my buddy because in a one versus one situation it's going to be incredibly hard for me to be able to deal with this okay with five minutes left on the game i got spotted so where would that mean that the ebr would be probably around here i'd say he could be back in this location maybe in those bushes or alternatively they could be going up towards the hill i tell my team that i've been spotted and i ping the map to suggest where the ebr most likely would be and i realize considering they're over in that location 
I think one of the best things that I could do would be able to pressure the cap circle to force the EBR to come to us. Remember, with the frontal armor on this tank and even with the side armor, it's going to be very tricky for that EBR to be able to get rounds into us reliably unless they manage to hit our lower plate. Our upper hull will ricochet even gold rounds from the EBR. Our side armor will absorb most rounds from the EBR as well unless they're hitting us literally at a flat angle for their shell. So I'm going to begin the cap. And I like the way that my buddy is playing here. Uh, in the VZ-55, they're taking the hill position and stopping the EBR from coming one way. This makes it a lot easier for me because um, now the only real vulnerable area I will have will either be this location or alternatively towards the north. I really thought that the EBR would try and make their way towards the center of the map. If they're going to shoot me right now where they spot me, they're probably going to have to spot me around here. The reason why I'm at the back of the cap circle as well is means they're probably not going to spot me until they have to force to come up the dip. The only way that they can really get me now is going to be over towards the northern flank. But in this situation, I feel that the EBR has most likely now enabled us to catch them. And they're trying to race away. They're thinking about coming back. And all I really have to do is just manage to catch some view range on the EBR. And they probably didn't expect me to come over that ridge. And maybe they didn't even expect me to have such good gun handling there to shut them down. All in all, the VZ-55 is looking like a tank that has everything. The speed to be able to race into a forward position. The reliability with its gun handling and its gun depression to be able to fight from that position. The double sting in its tail that it delivers twice in quick succession, delivering a thousand damage within two seconds of the first shot. And then the DPM to be able to reload to go again and of course the upper hull armor albeit with a bit of a weak point on top of the tank to be able to grind out its opponents this thing is looking ferocious and i think that it's going to be a great tank if it goes in with its current statistics which is far in comparison to what i thought about the rinoceronte that i thought it was much worse than it should be and wargaming didn't buff it in the subsequent test server iterations but remember that even though the next patch of World of Tanks is probably going to be coming out on Wednesday, the 11th of August, there's still a good amount of time for Wargaming to file off some of the statistics of the VZ-55. They could reduce its damage per minute, they could increase its intraclip reload, or they could just slow the tank down a touch. And it will definitely impact its competitive nature. But at the moment, I feel... Maybe it's just a touch too good. All you really need to know is that if it stays as it is, then it's definitely a vehicle that is worth getting. And if you're an aggressive player, you're going to be very competitive in this tank. And if you want to know how hard it will be to be able to get the VZ-55, then I thoroughly recommend checking out my YouTube video from yesterday, which gives you tips and tricks for getting up the Czechoslovakian heavy tank line about investing free experience and what to expect from the tier seven eight and nine new czechoslovakian heavy tanks anyway ladies and gents boys and girls that's it for today i really hope this video was enjoyable maybe just useful if it was give the video a thumbs up if you hated it however give it a thumbs down and let me know in the comments what you think about the vz55 do you think this thing looks outrageously good do you think it looks about right would you buff it would you nerf it and if you're watching this video as it's released on Sunday. Later on today, there's going to be a World of Tanks Tech Tree Showcase starting at 7 o'clock UK time. And this week, I'm going to be featuring the T100LT as it's going to be top of the tree or to the top starting Tuesday. And so come and find out everything you need to know about the Soviet light tanks before they are cheap and easier to be able to get soon. And so I'm really looking forward to seeing all of you live right now on twitch.tv forward slash quickie baby. And as always, thank you so much for watching. You've been epic and hopefully I'll see you soon.